just before we begin go further with the with the service, I want to take a moment to um, acknowledge a great loss in our community. Um, as many of you uh, already know, I'm sure our sister Lois went to be with Jesus yesterday, and um, there are, I know many who mourn her here in our community that are family, and we all mourn her as a sister in Christ and a dear dear friend. So I just want to take a moment to. Um, join in a, in a moment of silent prayer, and then I'm going to lead us in a prayer of, um, of commendation of Lois to God's love and care and mercy. Almighty and everlasting God, we commend to your loving care our sister Lois, and we pray that growing in knowledge and love of you she may go from strength to strength in service of your heavenly kingdom. Receive her with love. Embrace her with the light of your grace. And at the last day, raise her up with all your saints in the glorious victory of the resurrection. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, it should be all the time we appreciate him, which we do. We love you both very much, you and Kristen. And this is just an appreciation of uh, cards and some love and a gift from the church uh, oh for goodness. you all. And thank we you. love you all all the time. But October sheds a light on how great oh, you are. Thank you but so much. There you go. Oh my gosh. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Oh my, thank you, that's wonderful. I really, really appreciate that. And it's my great pleasure to serve you. God bless you all, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. Good. October 15th, the charge conference paperwork is due. October 18th is the food pantry prep day. So please be here at 2 p.m. On October 19th is the food pantry distribution day from one to three. And I know they can always use all the help they can get. October 22nd is our church picnic at Sturkey Park from 4 to 7. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing.
The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours for speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them God has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and runs its course with joy like a strong man. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its need. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can understand one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Also keep your servant from the insolent. Let them not have dominion over me. And I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We now move into a moment in the service when we share our celebrations and our prayer concerns and take everything on our hearts before the throne of grace in prayer. I'd like to invite you, first of all, to share any joys and celebrations that you would like to lift up this morning as part of our worship. Sister Carol is heading to New York to see her family. That's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. So we celebrate that and we pray for safe travels. I have a new niece. Heidi had her baby on uh, Monday, a, a real, real joy for the whole family. So we're grateful for a safe delivery and glad to welcome Kalani into our family. I'll also give, uh, give thanks for my sister and brother-in-law and my other two nieces for being here with us today. They're visiting in from out of town, so we're grateful to have them with us. Amen. We give thanks to God for the healing that in this case is coming in the form of a appropriate treatment facility. We give thanks for what God is already doing in Nancy's life and what will continue. Um, we pray to be a improvement in not only her, her um, health, but also in her emotions and her spirit. We give thanks and we pray for healing and continually pray for healing for Nancy. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue in prayer for Lisa, who is the daughter of the Cracker Barrel hostess, and she's, she's been asking, um, has asked us for, for prayer um, over the past few weeks, and we continue in prayer. Lisa's had to go into the hospital, and so we pray for healing, and we pray for peace and comfort, not only for Lisa, but also for her mother and for her entire family. 
Lord, hear our prayer. It is a tragedy in our community to ever have loss of life, but particularly in a situation like this, it's especially, especially terrible. We commend to God's loving care and mercy, Tyler, and also the other, the other person who was lost his life in this situation. We pray for the families that are in mourning. We pray for the, the, the community around Tyler in particular, of other, um, others in law enforcement, of, uh, of community leaders, and indeed of the Knox County community at large who are mourning the loss of a, um, a leader in the community, a, a person who was a figure of great importance for many. And so we pray for God's comfort and for God's peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our community, in our lives. And we pray especially for those who are in deep mourning at this terrible loss. Lord, hear our prayer. We commend to God's love and care and mercy Gavin, who was the victim of a fatal shooting last Monday, his funeral's today. We pray for his family and friends who are mourning. We pray that they would find comfort in the midst of tragedy and hope in the midst of despair. And we pray for an end to violence. We pray for an end to gun violence, an end to this seemingly unending parade of tragedies that we see played out in the news across our nation and even in our own community. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are dealing with cancer, asking for God to bring healing and for God to bring peace in the midst of anxiety. Lord, hear our prayer. So we lift up in prayer Jenny, praying for God to meet her needs and give her the peace, comfort, and joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. And we commend Tommy to God's loving care and mercy and pray for the family and friends who mourn his loss. Tommy is a neighbor, has been a neighbor of the church for many years. And so we give thanks for his life, his involvement in the community, and we pray for God's peace. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Jeremy and commend him to God's love and care and mercy. We pray for his family, those who are mourning a terrible loss. Uh, he was killed um, in service to his country, to his fellow citizens in an accident. And so we give thanks for his willingness to serve and ask for God's peace for those who mourn this terrible, tragic loss. Lord, hear our prayer. Yeah, as we uh, see an unfolding crisis in the Middle East, we pray for all of those who are involved in this, uh, in this terrible um, conflict. We pray for those Israelis who were brutally attacked, uh, many of whom lost their lives, others of whom lost uh, property and health, and, and we, we pray for God's peace. We pray for God's wisdom. We pray for the peace that can only come from the Holy Spirit. We pray for shalom for Israel. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Brandon's friend. For whatever he's dealing with, we pray that God will give him the comfort and peace that he needs to weather the storm. And we pray that God would reveal God's self to this friend in a very special way, that he would know the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Donna, who will be undergoing foot surgery this coming week. We pray for a successful procedure and for a rapid recovery so that she can get back on her feet and doing the things that she loves to do and the things that God has for her to do. Lord, hear our prayer. We commend to God's loving care and mercy the infant Stephen, who was the recipient of a heart transplant, but unfortunately his little body was not able to continue on this earthly journey. And so we commend him to God's loving care and mercy, remembering the words of our Savior who said, let the little children come unto me. And we pray for the family who is in the depths of devastation and despair, that they would experience comfort that can only come from the Holy Spirit and that they would know the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, hear our prayer. 
Most merciful God, we bring our prayers before you with confidence and trust, not because of who we are or what we bring, but because we know how good you are, how loving and kind, how gracious and merciful. We trust in the goodwill you have for us and for all people. And so we lift these prayers with confidence, remembering the words of your dearly beloved son, our savior, who promised that when two or three gather together in his name, you will be in our midst to hear our prayers and grant our requests. And so, Father, we do pray that you would grant our desires and petitions as may be best for us and for those whom we pray, granting all in this life knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. It says in this prayer that we prayed this morning that God is more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Now that means that God knows what we need before we even ask for it. And so when we come to pray, we don't have to think up big fancy words. We don't have to, um, to wonder what God is thinking about and try to read God's mind. We can know that God always is ready to hear our prayers because God knows what we need. And then it says, pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us, giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask. And what that means is that no matter what we've done, what mistakes we might have made, if we feel guilty about something, if we feel bad about something we did, that God is already forgiving us even as we come to God in prayer. And so when we go to God in prayer, we can expect that God will give us forgiveness and God will give us an abundance of gifts. You know what abundance means? A lot. It means a whole lot. God has, I do like your braids. Those are very cute, very cute. God is always ready to bless us, to bless us in our lives, to bless our families, to bless our studies at school, to bless the games that we play. God is with us all the time and knows what we need. And so you can pray any way and any time you want to. You can just say right now, you can say, thank you, Jesus. Can you say, thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. You could say, what's that? It made noise. That's your baby making noise? Yeah. That's okay. That river pressing that. Oh, she, oh, river pressed the button? Okay. Well, we'll put that on her tab. <laughs> so when you pray, you can say something as simple as, thank you, Jesus. Or you can say, I love you, Jesus. Or you can say, I need you, Jesus. And those are all prayers that God hears. And God knows what we need, and God knows who we are. And so you can remember to pray all the time, no matter where you are, because God is always with you, and God is always listening for your prayers, because God loves you. God loves you, and God wants to be with you and to give you good gifts. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these young people. Thank you for these children. Thank you for giving us this time together to speak of your goodness and your love. Bless these children in the coming week, in their play, in their studies, and in everything they do. Amen. God bless you. You all can go back to your seats now.
was a teacher to all of us, but some of us had her for a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> and the last time I read the scripture two weeks ago, I would, had joked about Pastor Tim giving me 26 verses to read. And so after church, I ran into her in the bathroom and she said, that was a long scripture. And I said, yeah. She said, well, you did good. I said, well, I had a lot of practice. You made me read it almost every Sunday morning. She said, well, I knew you were a good reader and I knew you would substitute words. And I said, yeah. Because it seemed like every Sunday I had to read it, the A word for donkey was in there, and I was not about to say the A word. And then before I could get back up here, somebody's told my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandmother, Amy saying bad words in Sunday school. So I could see it coming, and I would say, donkey. Uh. <laughs> Everybody else that would read it would say it and then giggle. And then it was hard to get everybody back on track. So I had to read a lot for her in Sunday school. <clears throat> I'll miss her. Um, so the scripture today, it's another long one. Uh, the first comes from Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46, this is the parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants, they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will, be, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected, has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Forgot during the prayers of the people, we have one more prayer request. I was speaking on the phone with Linda Puckett. She's asked for prayer for Diane Strickland, who will be having surgery tomorrow for cancer um, removal. So we pray for a successful surgery for Diane, and we pray for God's healing and God's peace. Lord, hear our prayer. 
I also spoke with Pastor Walter yesterday for a moment, and um, he sends his deepest condolences and his prayers for the community as, um, as we mourn the loss of our beloved sister Lois. Well, I have quite the task in front of me today with some very, very dense portions of Scripture. And again, Amy, I don't pick these. Because trust me, if I could pick, there are some I'd probably avoid. <laughs> we have in this parable another somewhat terrifying story about violence and death in which Jesus tells the tale of a vineyard owner who leases his property to some folk who basically break the terms of the lease and refuse to pay their, the, the owner's share of the crop, of the produce. And he sends person after person after person to try to collect. And every time the people he sends are beaten or killed or maimed or whatever. And he finally sends his own son thinking, surely they'll listen to my son. He's the closest you can get to me without being me. And um, of course, we know what happens. They kill him thinking that they can take the inheritance from him because he is no longer. And Jesus compares this to the lives of the people that he's talking to who are the temple officials, the chief, peace, chief priests, and the Pharisees. And he says to them, just like the vineyard is taken away from those wicked tenants and given to others who will give over uh, the, the portion of the crop, the fruit, the produce that, that is required, so the promise of the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Jesus says, and given to some folk who will produce fruit. Y'all aren't bearing fruit worthy of the kingdom of God, Jesus says. And so the kingdom of God is not going to be where you're planted. We're going to plant some people in the kingdom of God that bring forth fruit. And that is incredibly frightening, right? Because if you read it sort of at the surface, so to speak, it can come across as God is counting how many bushels of fruit I produce, and so I better get busy producing some fruit. That's kind of how it feels, right? I know for me, and many, many times throughout my life, I've had this feeling of like, am I actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I producing the fruit that'll make Jesus happy? Or am I going to get plucked up? Am I going to get thrown into the, into the fire? Am I going to be that chaff that blows away? I better produce some fruit. And the problem with that thinking is all the times I say I <laughs> in that sentence. Am I going to do it? Am I going to be good enough? Am I going to be able to do what God wants me to do? And so my task this morning is to talk about this parable in the context of what Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians. Because there is a very, very deep similarity between Paul and the temple authorities and the Pharisees that Jesus is addressing in his parable. You see, the fundamental thing that the Pharisees got wrong about Jesus and his ministry is they thought that he was diluting the law. He was, he was diluting what it meant to, to be part of God's covenant family. And he was taking away important parts of the heritage of the covenant, of the promise of the patriarchs, of the prophets. And what they didn't understand is that, in fact, what Jesus was doing was fulfilling the promise to the patriarchs, the covenant, the law, and the prophets. And in that fulfillment, he was bearing fruit worthy of the kingdom of God. And that fruit would spill out into all the world and be gathered in as a wonderful harvest of the kingdom. And that that fruit would include all of us. Because Jesus came to rescue Israel and in rescuing Israel to open up the covenant promise 
to all the world. Jesus' mission is much deeper and wider than the Pharisees could ever imagine. And so the Pharisees were under the misapprehension that because they were Pharisees, they were automatically included in God's kingdom program. They believed that the way they kept the law, the way they regularly attended worship and study, the way they lived their life and giving alms and, and, and doing acts of generosity, cardinal acts of charity, that sort of thing. They thought that that was their ticket into the kingdom of God. And in fact, because of that, sometimes they would do things like blow trumpets to let people know they were giving some money away. <laughs> They would have big ribbon cutting ceremonies, you know, for the latest addition to the synagogue that they paid for, that sort of thing. They thought that what they did was the fruit that God required. Perhaps even more to the point, they believed that the promise belonged to them. And see, that's what the tenants do wrong in the parable. You see, the issue with the tenants is that they're renting this vineyard from the landowner, and yet they believe that it and everything it produces belongs to them. They think they have the right to keep all of the produce for themselves. They think they have the right to hoard all of this goodness, all of these riches to themselves, that even the landowner doesn't have any claim to the fruits of his property. The tenants believe that so fully that they think that they could kill the heir and thereby keep not only everything they already have, but everything the heir might have in the future. Now, on the face of it, that's just deluded, right? Like, you, you can't possibly think that just by, I mean, it can't be that easy. You can't just kill an heir and then automatically get all their stuff. This isn't a video game. You know, you don't loot That's for you, Michael. <laughs> they believe that they have some sort of property ownership claim on what is not theirs. And that is the problem the Pharisees have. They believe that they have some sort of property ownership claim on the kingdom of God because of what they've done and who they are, and how just wonderfully great they've been throughout their life. And this is the exact issue that Paul is addressing here in this section of the letter to the Philippians. He's dealing with some folk who are sort of rolling out their own bona fides to express their authority and their claim on the kingdom of God. And Paul says, well, if you want to produce credentials, allow me to show you mine. <laughs> and that's why he goes through this litany of all of the things that Paul can lay claim to if he wants to place his salvation on the merits of his own righteousness. He's of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the best tribes, one of the most revered tribes. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the seventh day. Everything was, from the moment he was born, everything was done right, according to the absolute last punctuation mark of the law. He was a Pharisee, and a perfect Pharisee at that. Never made a mistake. Always did exactly what he was supposed to do to keep the law in its absolute perfection. His zeal for his faith and his pharisaical uh, demands, his zeal for that was so strong that he even persecuted the church and harried the first Christians out of Jerusalem. He was part of that posse that stoned Stephen to death. So if anyone wanted to put their faith in their own righteousness and ability to keep the law and their own zeal, Paul's like, I'm your guy. He 
But the kingdom of God will not be taken, will not be inherited by those who have kept the law perfectly, by those who have expressed enough zeal, by those who have done everything by the book and checked off every box on the kingdom of God application form. The kingdom of God is about bearing fruit, not checking boxes. And that's why Paul then goes into this second litany of all the things that he accounts now as garbage. All of that stuff, his Pharisaism, his lineage as a member of the tribe of David, his perfect record of law abiding, all of which is fine, good stuff, right? I mean, no one's gonna get thrown out of school for doing any of that. But he regards all of that as trash because he had an encounter with righteousness itself. He had an encounter with grace itself, with love itself. He had an encounter with God incarnate in Jesus Christ. And he realized in that flash on the road to Damascus that nothing else mattered, that it was all about Jesus. Because here's the really hard truth that perhaps Paul didn't understand until that moment when the Holy Spirit knocked him flat on his A word. (laughs) It was that moment that he realized that no matter how perfectly, no matter how righteously he had kept the law, it still wouldn't be enough because the kingdom of God doesn't belong to him. It belongs to those whom Jesus has called, who have submitted to the grace and the mercy of God revealed in Jesus Christ. It is God's grace, God's mercy, God's love revealed in Jesus that is the doorway to the kingdom of God. Not our works, not our lineage, not our track record. Because it doesn't belong to us. And because it doesn't belong to us, we don't get to decide who's in and out. When we realize that it's not ours, then we can receive it as the gift God intends. That's why Paul says, forgetting everything that is behind, I press forward toward the goal, leaving the past in the past. I look to the future that God has For me, for you, for all, it's a future of grace and love. It's a future in which we receive all of the goodness of God, all of the righteousness of Jesus. We receive that as a gift, not out of anything that we deserve, not out of anything that we have earned, but simply because of God's grace. And that not looking behind but pressing forward is such a comfort and a gift. Because it means two things. It means that we can leave behind that treadmill of works righteousness that so many of us are on for so much of the time, where we're just trying to get to the goal, but this treadmill won't go any farther forward where we do and we do and we do and it's never enough and we're always unsettled. We can leave that in the past 
We can leave our accomplishments, our works, our checklists, we can leave it all in the past. And you know, you know what else we get to leave in the past? Our sins, our mistakes, our trials. We can leave that in the past too. Because very often in my experience, and this is just my experience, the treadmill, like, like, like the gym membership that gets you to that treadmill is the stuff that you do that you regret and feel guilty about. Usually the reason we're on that treadmill of works righteousness is because we can't seem to atone for the things we know we need to atone for. We can't seem to repent for the things we know we need to repent of. We can't seem to put our troubles, our trials, our sins, our mistakes, we can't seem to put them in the past. And because we can't put them in the past, we can't move forward. Because we just stay on this treadmill of works and works and works and works because maybe someday we'll finally get, just, get it just right, just enough that we move an inch forward. We would give anything for just an inch, wouldn't we? And it leads to death. It leads to burnout. It leads to anxiety. It leads to fear. It leads to a, a spiritual death because we just become dead on the inside because we don't know what to do because our predicament never seems to change. But those who have grasped the gospel and understand, not with their heads so much, but with their hearts and their gut, understand that it's a gift. It's not ours. It's a gift that's given to us. Those are the ones who are able, not all at once, not perfectly. Just like Paul says, I've not gotten there yet. I'm not perfect yet. I've not done it yet. But I'm looking ahead and leaving, leaving the past behind. The way Paul's able to do that is by the grace of God because he's embraced Jesus and the future that Jesus holds. And when you meet really, really wonderful Christians, you know, strong Christians who just exude that peace and joy, you've met them, right? They exude that peace and joy, that, that calm and quiet confidence. I think of Lois, actually, as, as I, I didn't know her very long at all, but she's one of those people. And it's not because those people have like figured out some trick. Those who are full of the joy of their salvation have simply embraced the reality that Jesus is the one who brings us in. No one else, nothing else. It's Jesus. And so the invitation I have for you this morning is that if there is something you're struggling with, whether it be an intrusive, nagging thought about that thing you did 30 years ago that you really wish you hadn't, that thing you said last night at dinner that you really wish you hadn't, that thing you didn't say before it was too late that you wish you had, my invitation to you is to let that be behind you and look forward, not, not toward a goal of your own design, not even toward steps that you're going to order yourself, but simply look forward into the face of Jesus and see his outstretched nail-scarred hand and allow him to lead you into the future, leaving what is behind, pressing on toward what lies ahead. Because what lies ahead is, as the prayer of, our, of the week, or the prayer we prayed this morning, as it says, is more than we either desire or deserve. Or as Paul puts it, it's more than we could possibly imagine. It is deeper and wider than anything we could possibly envision in our frail human brains. You don't have to check any boxes. You don't have to figure out how to undo what you've done. 
All you have to do is embrace Jesus and trust that his grace can and will make all things right in the end. I've been using a phrase quite a lot lately, all will be well. My family will kind of tell you it's become my catchphrase of late. And the reason I say all will be well is not because I'm a sort of of Pollyanna optimist, because anyone that knows me well knows that's not true. All will be well because Jesus. St. Julian of Norwich, a British saint from many, many years ago, actually had a wonderful saying, all will be well and all will be well and every little thing will be well. That's where I got my catchphrase. (laughs) All will be well because Jesus embraces us and leads us into a future where all will be well, no matter what. That's the promise. And we can claim that promise today. No money down, (laughs) nothing due at closing. (laughs) It's yours because it's a gift. It's a gift. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.